A lot of my identity is, you know, I'm a cricketer. And the first wicket for Stella Campbell. Congratulations and well done. And when we went for a scan and there was a disc bulge um, in my L4, I think, that's sort of when surgery was put on the card. Oh, yes! And the ball after the power play finishes. You miss, I'm going to hit. Ultimately, you know, I want to be more than that. Reach out and, and ask for help and, um, you know, that's sort of essentially what I did. G'day, g'day. Welcome back to another episode of A Lot To Talk About. It is your boy, the captain of the ship, the man in charge, Bradley J. Driver. Of course, you can call me Brad. And I'm excited. We're in the studio in the HQ, which doesn't happen as often as I'd like these days. But I'm very blessed because today's incredible guest made the two-hour trip down to the gong to be here in the studio with me. I'm going to introduce her and give her the intro she deserves. She's an Australian cricketer a New South Wales representative cricketer. She plays within the Big Bash League. She's an incredible human being, and I can't wait to get into how we connected because it was such a great first initial connection and conversation. So from your home, your car, or wherever you are, give a very warm welcome to the one, the only, Stella Campbell. Thanks, Brad. That was a very flattering intro. Um, I'm so excited for this chat. Uh, yeah, as you sort of hinted at, we sort of made that connection. So I was super excited when you sort of suggested to come down here and have a chat. So um, yeah, really excited. I always have this real like fascination and interest in like exploring where a connection with someone starts. And ours was so natural in the sense that I was away with my old man at the time, so I was super relaxed mm. and just super cruisy. We were away caravanning in Nelson Bay, and I think you'd come across the clip with um, me on Uncle Nathan's podcast. Most of you will know Nathan Moss, who was a guest on this show too. And we just started to have this really deep conversation around sort of purpose and finding what seems to be a challenge for anyone in life and sport is detaching who you are as a person from the persona of what you do and the way that people see you in your work or your sport. And we just had this lovely conversation and like, you know, those couple paragraph messages where you're really getting into each other's lives and stories. And there was a real sense of honesty about who you are as a person. You're extremely humble, which I'm sure people will get the opportunity to see and hear throughout the course of this episode. And I just, I love that, you know, at the age of 20, there was this incredibly just just incredibly mature head on your shoulders and the way that you spoke about your current situation, your challenges and, you know, what you love about the opportunity to play sport and do what you love for a living. It just, I just thought you had such a great nature about you. So when I sat down and I was sort of looking at who I wanted to get on the podcast over the next months, you know, I thought far out that conversation I had with Stella would be so useful to so many people who are either in the same position or facing other adversity in life. And so here we are. Yeah, no, 100%. That's really flattering. But um, yeah, going back to sort of how we met, I sort of was at a time when, um, you know, I was, I think I was only one week post-op and I was sort of really just not enjoying where I was at. And um, yeah, I stumbled across that podcast and it struck a chord with me and I was like, wow, like this guy, you know, he knows what he's talking about. And um, yeah, I had to flick through your stuff and um, yeah, reached out um, and sort of just said my situation. And, you know, you gave me some great advice and really got me through those sort of tough first few weeks. Um, but yeah, like it was just so, so cool to, to reach out and, and find all that stuff. And I think for a lot of people who are going through a challenging time, it's really important to be able to, you know, reach out and, and ask for help. And, um, you know, that's sort of essentially what I did. But yeah, like um, I haven't really done too much of this podcasting stuff, so I'm a little bit nervous. No, but, you're um, doing amazing. <laughs> you're built for this, believe me. Yeah, like honestly, you know, I'm, I'm just living the life that I am at the moment and I'm sort of just going along with it where I can. But um, yeah, look, it's been really cool to, to find this and be able to get through sort of a challenging sort of time. Definitely. Well, firstly, very humbling what you said. You know, I'm glad that some of the conversation we could have had helped and I almost feel, um, I would say it's not even my advice. I'm very lucky that what I do now is sit down and speak to people who are a lot smarter and more intelligent than I am, <laughs> who give me heaps of advice and I'm kind of just spitting it back out with my own twist on it. But 
it wasn't even advice to be honest i think i've just seen so much of your situation in my past situations of self-discovery and you know i guess to give the audience a bit of context um you've just had a, a major surgery back surgery which is always scary and as an athlete even scarier especially at a young age talk us through the injury and sort of how that dawns on you that okay i'm gonna have to go through this experience now mm, yeah so probably about five months ago um i sort of started getting a bit of back pain and um as a typical fast bowler i just sort of assumed it's just tight muscles and you know i'll get yeah. through it in a few weeks um but yeah and it ended up being a little bit more than that and um, when we went for a scan and there was a disc bulge um in my l4 i think and um yeah we managed it conservatively conservatively to get through the season and um you know by the end of that it sort of didn't really help and we were sort of at the stage where you know we're probably gonna have to do something bigger here and that's sort of when surgery was put on the cards and at the time I was kind of thinking you know oh, I want to you know I want to get this right but you know is surgery the, the best thing so mm. it was a big decision for myself and for my family but um you know i do believe we made the right one because you know ultimately it's it's a small sacrifice for hopefully a longer career for me so um yeah obviously you know it's a, it's a long road back but um you know I've got the best people around me at Cricket New South Wales helping me through I'm very lucky to be in that system with you know Definitely. such experienced medical people who are going to get me back to where I was and hopefully better so yeah, I'm about halfway through now, but uh, yeah, I've got a long way to go, but it's going to be a really exciting journey, I think. Definitely. And, you know, I think anyone can, you know, there's probably a lot of people sitting, listening to or watching this now, and it's hard to imagine what that feels like because not everyone is a professional athlete, but I actually think it's incredibly relatable for everyone because we all know the feeling of loving something. I think you've only just got to think, what am I extremely passionate about? And if the idea of ever doing that to my standard is challenged or potentially taken away from me, how would that feel? And and that gives you a sense of exactly what you'd been experiencing and currently working back through. And, you know, I think about it with running. Like, oh, far out. I'm on a D so I'm on a deload week this week. It's a six week of my plan. And just the idea that I'm running like ten or so Ks less than I will be next week, I'm like, fuck, this sucks. <laughs> like this is so hard. I just want to go for a run. Mm. But it's, you know, you got to make those tough decisions and like you said, think long term. I guess I want to go back and maybe backtrack a bit until we get to what's exactly led you to this moment mm -hmm. and talk about the beginnings of your career and even a little bit of childhood. We sort of spoke about off air today just while we're having a coffee, you know, that cricket is something that is such a part of our Aussie culture. Like everyone can relate to sitting in the lounge room on Boxing Day in a, in a singlet and shorts, sweating up a storm, trying to hog the fan and watching the Boxing Day test with family. Was that a part of your childhood growing up? I know you said the old man's a bit of a cricket tragic and... Yeah, it's it's so iconic. Hey, you set the scene so well. Um, for me, probably cricket didn't come in until I was a little bit later. So I didn't really grow up with those traditions of, you know, sitting in front of the TV, watching cricket all the time. I kind of, you know, I was down at the beach or, you know, hanging out with my friends. So I wasn't sort of raised as a cricketing child. Um, but in saying that, I love sport. I was always active outdoors as a kid. So um yeah, cricket wasn't as so much on the forefront, but, um, you know, definitely when I got older and started getting into it more, I can definitely, you know, see myself watching cricket all the time and just loving, you know, being exposed to it. And um, I guess that was sort of around the time when women's cricket was coming into it a bit more. Yeah. So I was, you know, I was able to see women on TV and, and go to grounds and watch women playing cricket. And I think, you know, that's something that I'm super grateful for now because I guess, you know, those women probably didn't have that. So, um, yeah, it's really cool to have that. Can I interject there? How important do you think it was for your growth and love of the game that you were able to see women actually playing on telly and seeing possibilities for a future career? Yeah, it's definitely super important. I think, you know, 
you know, I probably wouldn't have known that women played cricket or I would have thought that women played with the men at the highest level. So seeing that, you know, there was that possibility and there was that opportunity to play at the highest level, that sort of really inspired me and really allowed me to be like, hey, I can do this for a living and, you know, I want to do this for a living. So Mm. I think that's, it's so cool that young girls now can see that and there's such a clear pathway to get to the top. Um, so yeah, I'm really, really lucky in that respect. At what point in your life do you think, and this is me just being as I am, just skipping to all parts of the story (laughs) here, but at what point in your life do you think it was like really clear that, okay, there's actually a a very clear pathway and a very clear opportunity for me to do this full time? And did you have to sacrifice things like education and, you know, sacrifice other moments in your life to get to this point or were you were able to sort of keep moving in that linear path of finishing school, potentially studying and then diving into sport? Yeah, so um, I guess the first time I really realised that I was good at cricket and I could maybe, you know, take it on, um, I probably made my first rep team when I was about 15 and at that point I was like, hey, you know, like I've, I've played in a rep team, I could maybe keep going with this and Um, so I did and yeah I guess it was a pretty simple pathway I kind of just kept working away at it I was at school and um, yeah I guess I just kept doing both things and I was able to find that balance but Mm. um, yeah like I finished school two years ago now and I was at the time playing in the big bash and doing my HSC and living we were in the stage of living in a bubble essentially so we were out in a hotel and I was being shipped off to do my HSC exams at the same time so it's very chaotic but um yeah in saying that like it's it's been super clear and super easy and we've always had the support to to manage other stuff while we're still young and playing cricket so it's it's been good in that respect I've been able to have a pretty balanced lifestyle Definitely. Were there any friends or connections that you kind of had? Because for those of you who don't know, you grew up in North Sydney in Newport, correct? Yeah. And like, did you have any other girls that like you went to school with or played cricket with on the weekend that were sort of on that same trajectory as you? Uh, so I didn't, in my sort of in Newport and on the beaches, I didn't really have too many other girls or any of my close friends from that area playing cricket. And even now a lot of, no one really lives near me who's I'm playing cricket with. So it's, it's quite funny, I guess, to look at it that way. But, um, I always, you know, I had really close friends, um, in cricket and that's, I think a big reason why I still play and why I love it so much is just those friendships that I've built and, Mm. and, you know, they're like no other. So yeah, I guess in saying that, I didn't really have too many friends that played, but my friends always have supported me and they, you know, they get to any games that they can and they always get around me. And um, so, yeah, I'm really lucky in that respect. That's so good because I feel like it's a big part of it, right? And any athlete I speak to, the community of, or well, any team-based athlete, that, and to be honest, even in individual sports, there's teams that go into every individual success, but that communal feeling of like feeling like you're a part of something that's bigger than you Mm. is really I guess it's something that you really attach yourself to and it becomes really exciting and it's very it's very nice that maybe at your moments of challenge others are at their moments of triumph and they can lift you with them and vice versa you know like when you feel good that energy rubs off on the rest of the team and I think it's it's quite interesting hearing you say that there wasn't really anyone from your area. While she had really supportive friends outside of cricket, did you ever feel like an outsider because the goals that you wanted were so different to the people immediately around you? Yeah, I think, yeah, that was probably a bit of a tough thing to deal with when I got into my teenage years and sort of, you know, girls were going out or doing other things while I, I was sort of focused on training. So yeah. it was... it ultimately came down to my mindset and I was you know I was pretty set on where I wanted to go and I was pretty determined to get there so I was you know nothing was going to put me off that course so yeah I guess I had my I relied on my family a lot in that you know they supported me and wanted me to do the best that I could so um yeah I, got, I guess it was a little bit hard having you know friends who weren't sort of doing the same thing as you mm. were doing but um yeah ultimately I just had to be pretty determined and you know trust that you know I was getting going to get where I wanted to go so I was you know I had to put in that work and uh, you know I obviously loved the game so much so I was willing to sacrifice whatever it was to ensure that I could get there definitely is there any family sporting pedigree like did anyone in your family represent or play sport professionally 
Uh, no. So my family sort of, my dad was uh, into his surfing when he was younger and yeah. my mum claims um, my cricketing from her street cricket. So, okay. um, you know, no <laughs> professional um, sporting uh, in the family, but uh, yeah, look, my parents were both active. So yeah. um, that's sort of, I guess, where I get it. Because I can remember as a child, like vividly, one of like, the most mentally tormenting parts of my childhood was having a dad who is good at absolutely everything physical in the world and like put any sort of like sport in front of him and he's amazing at it. And I still remember like playing cricket with my dad. We used to have, so we had like a front yard and sort of like a backyard, but then we had like a side strip and it was concreted Mm -hmm. and that was like the cricket pitch. And like, you know, it's like you hit the window, you're out. Like all those little boundaries (laughs) and things that you can't do that make it very untraditional cricket. But my dad never went easy on me. Yeah, It was always like he was coming down with the absolute quickest ball he could and like he'd bowl me six times before. (laughs) I think I had like five lives basically every time we played. Yeah, Just so I could try to stay in and get a rhythm in bat or like I'd bowl and he'd hit me over the head for six all the time and I'd always be chasing balls. And I remember this one day so vividly because it was one of the most sweet but also bitter. It was a bittersweet moment of my cricketing career against (laughs) dad where we're at the botanic gardens it was easter we used to go to the botanic gardens every easter as a family and as dad always would he'd open the batting and he'd pretty much close the batting because you wouldn't be able to get him out (laughs) and i reckon he'd been in bat for about an hour (laughs) and i was like i just want to get this bloke out the whole family's playing like 10 of us and I've bowled this ball and he's just given me a little bit of a lob, you know, so I could catch it. Got under it and I caught it and I was that pumped. I remember like, you know, you pump, you sort of like underarm peg the ball yeah. away. <laughs> yeah. And I still remember this tennis ball at pace hitting this baby in the <gasps> head and knocking it off its two feet onto the grass. Oh, no. It was like this moment of oh, unbelievable triumph and victory just completely spoiled because yeah. I basically flogged this baby from the distance and like felt so bad but also at the same time so good yeah because I'd bowled dad out but like I feel like like we said it's such a part of Australian culture that having active parents definitely helps yeah and it it pushes you it does because you want to impress them Mm, definitely yeah has that been hard in the, the injury recovery process because obviously so much of who you are is being an athlete but it's so much of that persona and sometimes it's really hard to detach that from who you are as a person. Mm-hmm. Have you struggled with that at points in, I guess, your, your early career? But, you know, you've been playing for a couple of years now. You've been playing reps since 15. And do you sometimes get a little bit too attached to your success on the cricket field being your success as a person? Yeah, I guess, like, you know, it can be tricky. And um, certainly in this injury period, having, you know, not being able to be physically active, which is something that, you know, I obviously love and and love doing. So having that sort of stripped was a little bit challenging and sort of, yeah, I guess a lot of my identity is, you know, I'm a cricketer, but um, ultimately, you know, I want to be more than that. And um, I don't want to, you know, rely on that to get me Mm. through each day. So it has been a challenge, um, but I think in saying that, it's been really cool because I've been able to, you know, find other things that I'm passionate about. And, Definitely. You know, whilst I can't work on who I am as a cricketer and improve my skills and my fitness, um, you know, I can work on who I am away from cricket and work on, you know, where I want to go when I finish playing cricket because, you know, ultimately we're not going to be playing cricket forever. Um, certainly with my back, I'm not going to be playing until I'm 40 or anything like that. So... Uh, yeah in saying that it's been yeah a really unique opportunity I think you know one that potentially if I didn't get this injury I may not have dedicated the time to finding who I am away from cricket and building my identity and you know finding my values and things like that I may not have found the time to do that if I didn't have this injury so I think you know it's been really unique in that that I've been able to sort of you know identify those things and really create myself a path of where I want to go when I finish the game. If it's not too personal, would you mind maybe opening up about that a little bit, like talking about, and the reason I ask this is because I've had this incredible privilege over the course of the last, more so the last year to really connect with some different athletes and a lot of the different athletes I've connected with have had a conversation around this and finding yourself outside of the sport, finding out who you are as a human being and 
how you can almost use the sport as a platform to to then push that and to grow yourself as a person and to serve others. And I've had some really beautiful conversations with um, now my mate Zach Lomax, who's quite close to me, and Harry Garside is another one. He's just such a good human being and has such a great heart. And we've spoken about Ben Crow. And you've probably heard me talk about Ben Crow before on the show. Just an incredible mindset coach for athletes. And listening to him talk about Andre Agassi and his work with Andre, and then also listening to Harry talk about having read Andre Agassi's book, and I can't even remember what it's called now, um, but it was an amazing book. I listened to it. And one of the key themes in the book was, you know, his story is very different to yours in the sense of, you know, he was almost forced to play tennis mm. as a kid where, you know, you've played because of the love. But there was this struggle with at the times of injury or the times where things weren't going right, the, the crushing feeling of not being the world number one or not being at his best really shrunk his persona until he really worked on who he was as a person and his values he didn't really start to get the most out of life and so i'm interested to sort of dive into what are some of the things that you've discovered throughout this process about yourself that maybe you didn't appreciate pre-injury yeah well i guess you know first and foremost i'm studying event management so that's kind of a really big thing for me Mm. when I finish cricket that um, I really am passionate about um, and that I'll probably dive into and looking at, you know, getting some internships and some experience. Amazing. um, Basically, you know, that's sort of where I want to dedicate a lot of my time and um, just completing that course. So that's obviously one of the main things, but I guess sort of just learning a bit more about myself and um, discovering, you know, my, my values and where I set my, you know, energy and my time whilst I, you know, I'm not able to work on my cricketing skills, as I said. So, um, you know, I obviously really love my family. So I've been getting a lot to, getting to spend a lot of more time mm. with them and just, um, you know, valuing them and thanking them for everything that they do. And I think ultimately, you know, the first few weeks after surgery, if, if I didn't have them, I would have been so lost. And, um, you know, as I said, like we how we found each other at that time, I was, you know, in bed every day and just sort of not really having a reason to get up because you know I was in pain and I couldn't didn't really have anything to do Mm. so at that time I was just you know I was I was pretty upset and just you know it's been so different in the past at this time you know I normally wake up and I'm excited to try and get fit get strong get better at cricket and um you know these these those past few weeks I was waking up and thinking you know what am I doing today like how am I ever going to get through the day I have nothing to do and I think, you know, having my family there for me at that time, it just sort of, you know, that that was my reason to get up. Um, I wanted to be there for them and help them and um, cherish them and thank them for everything that they'd done for me. So, um, yeah, I guess it was cool to learn to learn about that and find out, you know, you know, find a new purpose. As you mentioned in your podcast, you know, I, I couldn't get up and be fit and be strong. So I wanted to get up and better myself and find something that, you know, find a reason to get out of bed each day. And, you know, whether that was just making someone else smile, it was kind of just a different thing each day, depending on how I was feeling. So, um, yeah, I think one day it was kind of like, all right, get up and I want to make someone smile today. Um, so it's a little task, but you know, something that my energy capacity at the time I could do and, yeah. um, something that, you know, would make me smile as well. Cause I'm, you know, I love bringing joy to others and I love making other people happy. So, um, just finding little ways to, you know, get yourself excited for the day is something that really benefited me at that time. You know, I love that. And it's, it's a conversation I've been having so much lately and it's, it's probably one of the things I consistently talk about on this podcast because not out of a point of righteousness but out of a point of understanding that and discovering that had such a significant impact on my life and the quality of my life and the direction of it that I feel like it'd be wrong of me not to talk about it. And I had this really... I think as a, as a younger person, purpose isn't really spoken about. I think the younger generation now have an amazing opportunity to learn about these things much earlier in school and through social media and podcasts and all of the forms of media and outreach that we have. But as a young person, I almost, I almost confuse purpose with goals. And like, 
you know, I would have thought that my purpose at one point was to be an amazing rugby league player and then, you know, like health reasons stop that and you feel like a little bit lost or, you know, I would have thought that my purpose at one point was to be the number one real estate agent in the country and then I kind of stopped loving real estate and I felt so lost. I was like, who am I outside of this job? And I heard it recently on Hugh Van Cullenberg's podcast. <laughs> I'm the biggest Hugh Van Cullenberg nut hugger. Like I talk about the guy so much, but he was speaking to Glenn Robbins and Glenn Robbins, for those of you who don't know from Kath and Kim, um, Kel, the man himself, Russell Coit, <laughs> such an iconic Aussie actor. They were speaking about this topic of purpose and Glenn was sort of speaking about a few different ideas and concepts. And one of the things that um, Hugh's brother, Josh, actually mentioned was he said, purpose is something that can't be taken away from you. And I thought, Wow, even that's a really nice way of explaining it because so many people in sport or life or any area attribute, like if your goal is to be, you know, the number one fast bowler on the Australian cricket team or if, you're, if, if that's what you think your purpose is, well, that can be taken away from you because someone else can come through and, and take that spot or you can lose a spot through injury and all of a sudden you feel completely lost. But if, like you said, your purpose is to uplift people and make people happy through your platform well then that's something that no one can take away from you you've got that opportunity every day and i think people confuse purpose with this thing that needs to become solely what you do for a career or it needs to be like this huge just like massive thing that feels so far from where you're at now and it literally can be the simplest thing and i think one of the biggest purposes and most important purposes on the planet is to be a good parent like to to nurture children to give children a great opportunity to grow and feel loved and feel like they've got a place in the world or whether it's to be an amazing you know brother or family member or whatever it is it's it's so simple but it's something you can always come back to it's something you can always work towards regardless of what you're doing in life and I'm so happy to hear that you feel like you've found that now because I recognize in you a quality to connect with people at such a young age that I think is going to be so beneficial for so many people in you know the the younger sporting space and for so many women coming through in sport and so many young lads coming through in sport who can look to you and see such a good quality in who you are as a human and go well whatever i do in life that is the most important thing and and it, it so is yeah right we're more than you know athletes and i spoke about this earlier with you before just being around the Australian team and seeing, you know, those women and seeing, you know, they're just like me. And it's, it's really cool for, um, individuals to see that, you know, we're all humans at the end of the day. Um, we're just on different paths. So, um, I think for me, that was really cool. And it was really, you know, eye opening in that, you know, I can do what they're doing, but you know, I'm on my own journey as well. So I don't try and attach too much of, you know, who I am to cricket because I know cricket is not forever. And, um, you know, I want to further myself as a human as well. Um, obviously, I love cricket. And right now, that's, you know, my biggest goal, my biggest desire is to, you know, reach that top level. But, you know, I'm, I'm more than that, essentially, as well. So if I'm, you know, dedicating enough time to other parts of my life, then I feel like, you know, that's, that's the best way to go about it. What do you feel like have been some of the best resources for you in that self discovery? Like, have there been, you know, this is one of the questions I'll ask you later in our little recap, too. But like, have there been books, podcasts, or have there been specific people who you've gone to throughout this process to really sort of get your head and your emotions in the right place? Yeah, so actually, um, Chloe Dalton, um, who is a AFL player, I believe now, but she played rugby sevens for Australia. She actually had the same procedure as me um, probably about a year ago. Um, so I've followed her Instagrams and and followed her stories along with her process from recovery and um, obviously she's back now killing it so it's really been really cool for me to see that and see that you know she's had the same thing and she's back Mm. playing where she was so I followed her quite closely but um, I guess in saying that I've also sort of just wanted to go about it myself and try and just learn as as it is I haven't really sort of Um, gone to any sort of books or podcasts in this sort of space I've kind of just tried to take each day as it comes Mm. and just work it out myself essentially I feel like that's kind of 
you know, kind of cool. A lot of people have asked me, you know, like, oh, you know, who, who have you, what advice have you taken or anything? And I've kind of just, I'm kind of just on this journey myself. I'm yeah, kind of just that. learning it and um, taking each step as it comes. So that's, that's kind of where I'm at it with it at the moment. It's really interesting you say that because I think that's probably really important. Like I know I'm, I've probably been guilty of in the past going to other people for advice and then applying that advice and then maybe six months down the track going maybe that wasn't the advice for me and it's probably because I've not asked myself the right questions and allowed myself to come up with answers like I had a podcast last week with Rich Devinney retired Navy SEAL and founder of a a book or author of a book and founder of a business called The Attributes and he talks about developing attributes and he's trained SEALs as well as being one and just in an incredible space where he's just a very intelligent guy. And one of the quotes from the podcast was, and this podcast blew my mind because of the way this guy articulates this information. And he said, the quality of our lives is directly proportionate to the quality of the questions we ask ourselves. And that really made me think. And it made me realize that I definitely tell myself a lot of things, but I don't ask myself enough questions. Mm. And I think it's really healthy that you said you've kind of gone on this journey for yourself and you've you've allowed yourself to figure these things out. And I definitely agree with what Rich said and I agree with the way that you've applied it to this situation that if you can understand who you are and what you need in yourself, then those lessons go with you forever. You always come back to that. Have you journaled through some of this process or written stuff down as, as almost like a reminder or a formula? Yeah, definitely. I've, um, I really like journaling. My best friend actually got me into it probably a year ago and um, I can't believe I had, hadn't done it before yeah. that because it's, it's really cool. And it's cool to look back on as well. So I've definitely sort of journaled as to where I am and sort of, you know, each week and even now, like looking back on week one and thinking, you know, I was in bed each day and like I was upset, didn't have anything to do. It's cool to look back on it now and seeing, you know, where I am, you know, six weeks post-op seeing like, oh, you know, I'm getting into the gym more, I'm doing more, I'm moving more, I'm, I'm feeling happier in myself. So, um, yeah, it's cool to, to do that. And I think it's really important to write down these things. So, you know, you don't forget, um, I probably have a worse memory than, um, <laughs> most people. So it's cool for me to look back on that and sort of, um, reflect on where I've come from as well. So yeah, that's been really important and, and really, really cool, I guess, to follow me along this journey. And I think, you know, not to say that I won't lean into those things in the future or when things get harder in in rehab um but yeah for the moment I've just been going along by myself and obviously got my my teammates and my friends and my family and and my staff um at Cricket New South Wales helping me and supporting me through it but for the most part you know I'm I'm just you know discovering each step and going along with the process um where it takes me yeah definitely I think it's, it's such an interesting thing. I, I reckon there'd be so many, and it's, it's typically young dudes because I used to be one of them. There'd be so many young dudes who are like maybe like 15 to early 20s who would be sitting there right now going, oh, journaling, like that sounds a bit weird. Like why would I write my feelings and thoughts in a book? And I was probably one of those dudes until a couple of years ago. But I think, <laughs> let me tell you, you get to a point where I'm 26 now, <laughs> your coffees and conversations with mates come about what you journaled about the night before that morning. And like, eventually you'll see so much benefit in it. So I really recommend starting as soon as you can. And I love it. There's so many great athletes now. I think as Aussie kids, we look up to athletes and we look up to entertainers and people in that space. And that's why I love doing this. Like I said to you before the show, I think it humanizes the experience of life for so many people who feel as though they're different athletes or to entertainers or people who are, you know, in the public eye, but they look up to them. And we're all actually quite the same as human beings and we all go through the same struggles and adversity, you know, with different flavors, of course, you know, everyone's struggles and challenges are different, but, you know, these little tools and tips, just they're so helpful. And, you know, Matthew McConaughey spoke about it a lot in his book and his interviews post is he's like, I always journaled the challenging times of my life he said, I wish I journaled all of my life so that I could go back on the good things and find the winning formulas. I'm probably the opposite to him. I like to talk about the things that are great mm. and probably sometimes internalize without writing down when I'm going through challenges. 
And so I think just like a journaling practice, even if it's, you know, some people is daily, it's every couple of days, if it's once a week, a bit of a recap. And I think for probably plenty of young people who are new to it, even just sitting down once a week and writing some thoughts on paper, it's, so, it's a freeing feeling. To get that out of your head and just put it on paper feels so relaxing and calming. And it gives you something to look back on. So I definitely recommend it. Yeah, and I'm the same. I was definitely like, why would I journal? Like, why would I write down these things? I don't care about it. Like, just it is what it is. Um, but yeah, like I said, my best friend was like, no, like you need to do this. She bought me a, a little journal um, to yeah. write down. And I sort of just started and, you know, you kind of just write what comes to you. And yeah. I think, you know, it's so cool to, yeah, like you said, just get it out of your head and get it on paper. Um, you just feel like almost a weight's been lifted off your shoulders when, you, when you get it out. So it's, yeah, whether it's positive, negative, whatever's happening, um, I definitely think it's cool to just get it out and, yeah, I was definitely one of those kids who was like, I don't want to do that. But um, yeah, now like even, you know, talking about it, I think a lot of, you know, my teammates at cricket, they would probably be like, you know, you don't need to do that. Like, it's just, you know, we'll just go along with it. And, um, you know, I'm really, I'm passionate about it. So um, I'm, yeah, 100% not afraid to say, you know, do it and try it. Um, you know, it's one of those things, don't knock it till you try it. Um, Definitely. Because it's, yeah, it's really an amazing thing to do. And it's, yeah, like you say, it's so freeing. So good to hear. Hey, I really want to sort of dive into what maybe like the progression of like your athletic ability looks like is I know you've got Cricket New South Wales who sound like they're heavily involved in your development and your recovery, but are there people that you seek outside of that system for coaching or training or mindset? Mm, yeah, definitely. So Cricket New South Wales are amazing and um, I always, you know, they go to them first. They're the best heads that I trust so much. So um, away from that, I do have a private skills coach um, yep. who's also one of my best mates now. So, um, amazing. you know, we don't really, you know, we're just there. We're just mates and, you know, he'll give me a few tips here and there and, you know, there's a lot of banter and um, I can sort of go to him with any, anything. So it's a really cool relationship and I'm that's so awesome. glad that I have that now. So that's probably the main one um, away from cricket that I go to just, you know, for advice. And it's not, not because I don't get that at Cricket New South Wales. It's just sort of, sort of like an outside perspective away yeah. from the pressures of selection and that sort of thing that's in cricket it's just cool to have someone that's kind of on your side so yeah that's probably the main one for me definitely that's it's really interesting because I feel like most successful athletes have someone outside of their systems mm. you know it's speaking to a few of the footy boys and they might have like a breathing coach or a mindset coach out of the sport and I think having like you said a few different perspectives always helps like a second opinion is nice at times and yeah. someone who maybe can be a little harsher with you yeah. knowing that it's coming from a place of love or you know, is definitely healthy. Talk to me about the feeling of getting the first cap for New South Wales and then the first cap for Australia. How does that feel and how would you rank those things amongst, you know, triumphant moments in the journey? Yeah, um, honestly, pretty surreal moments that are kind of blend into one at the time you know you kind of just you look forward to this thing so much and you know there's such a big build up around it and then you know it kind of happens and it's gone like that so it's it's a bit weird but um yeah no getting my New South Wales cap was unreal and um you know I think I was down at Hurstville Oval and uh Alyssa Healy presented it to me Amazing. and um you know there's quite a for those who don't know you know we have a cap presentation and someone you know will say a few words and make it really special so it's a really unique thing but it's it's really cool and um yeah, like I said, it was kind of a blur at the time. And looking back on it now, I think, you know, I wish I soaked it up a bit more. I was kind of probably just really nervous at the time to get out there in the field and play and bowl my first ball. That um, I kind of didn't really remember too much of the ceremony, but um, it's probably the same with the Australian one. I kind of just was a bit emotional for my first um, cap presentation. Um, Elise Perry presented that one. Oh, and, amazing, yeah. Um, she said a little bit about my um, family and she'd actually gotten some words from them. And I think when she mentioned that, I just 
started crying of and course, yeah. um you know because obviously they're they're my reason for playing and I love them so much so when they said some words it was it was really special and um it was kind of unique to how they speak and it, you know they weren't there but it kind of felt like they were so um really really special moments and um you know obviously playing for those teams is really special but having those words said before you go out onto the field just make it so much more special and yeah I was so fortunate to have those experiences and um be able to be put in those positions and represent my state and my country is you know not something that every um 19 or 18 at the time you know 18 year old would get so um I obviously am so grateful for those and um yeah so lucky to have had such um amazing people give me those caps as well of course how so were you 19 when it was first cap for Australia uh so yeah I was 19 yeah yeah how was that experience who'd you play against uh, so my first game was a one day um, up in Mackay actually. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yes. Yeah, True so, cricket weather. Yeah, Just, I know. Oh. Yeah. So we were playing against India, um, which was you know, insane. Like, mm. you know, they're cricket mad country. They like it's, it. it's religion for them pretty much. So um, playing against them was really cool, but um, I was obviously very nervous. I think I've, I've come a long way in my, in my nerves around the game. And obviously, you know, I still get nervous but I think it's more excitement now. I think, you know, back then I was kind of just like, oh my gosh, like I'm playing for Australia. I'm, I'm so scared right now. Like I'm almost, you know, dipping into the, I'm not good enough to be here. Um, that sort of mindset, which is something that I've worked a bit on. Um, but yeah, I guess at the time I was kind of like trying to just soak it up and be a part of the team, which was really cool. But um, yeah, I guess that experience was really cool. And being a part of that team was um, something that I've dreamt a lot about. So it was it was really cool to be a part of that. When you talk about that negative mindset of, because this is definitely something that I I spoke about this the other day and one of my mates pulled me up on this. So my mate, Fernie, who listeners to the podcast will know very well, he often sits behind the camera just as company. He's a good <laughs> man. And we, we have really interesting conversations at coffee. Like our coffee chats aren't <laughs> casual coffee chats. They're quite deep. And we'd done an exercise last week where we sat down and we, in a very loving way, brought up some of our limiting beliefs. So I would address some that I see in him and that I wanted to squash for him and vice versa. And one of the things he said to me, which hit me for a bit of a six, to use a cricket um, cricket (laughs) analogy there, was he said, it baffles me that you can stand on a stage in front of a couple hundred people and wear your authentic self as a badge of honor and your challenges as a badge of honor yet in other areas of your life more so relationships (laughs) you can allow that to be such a limiting belief and I'd never thought of it that way before and it really interests me where then it, it become very present for me that I probably need to do a little bit of work internally on seeing the value that I provide and and seeing myself as someone who is valuable to other people and he, you know, hearing you talk about that there and that mindset of I'm not good enough to be here, what do you think helped you work through that to the point where you now say you're, you're more comfortable? Was that experience or was it almost like sort of like softening the excitement of the world stage and just getting back to oh, I'm just playing cricket? Mm, yeah, I think it's definitely experience and um, just sort of living through that time and being able to sort of navigate my own way like I said you know getting through it myself but I think also we just have great support around us and great teammates and people who are always encouraging us so you know it's it's mostly experience when you're sort of living through that and playing more cricket you know you build that confidence Mm. but ultimately yeah it is just you know we're just playing cricket here and you know this is what we train for this is what you know essentially we live for and this is what we do so it's just another game um and that's something that I've really had to come to terms with because you know obviously nerves are a good thing right you know of course you it means you care and it means you value what you're doing so um I just tend to look at it that way and I think also I, I think I know myself a lot better now and I know Um, what I stand for and who I am and I feel like in those challenging moments I can come back to that and that sort of brings me out of that state of you know oh like I'm not good enough here like what am I doing um you know if I'm going through that I can sort of bring myself back to you know I've worked here for this and I've trained for this and 
that sort of helped me navigate sort of that that inner critic that's um, in our minds telling us, you know, we, we can't do this or trying to always bring us back a peg. So it's it's really cool to be able to say that I've sort of navigate that. In no way have I perfected it. I'm always going to, you know, have that there that's trying to chip away at me. But um, I think for the most part, like I've been able to improve from where I was to thinking like I can't do this to be able to like, no, like this is what I trained for and I can do this. What do you think would be the most memorable moment on a cricket field? Um, oh gosh, that's a tough one. Um, I'm going to say probably taking my first test wicket um, was a pretty cool one. Uh, I think it was a snick and Elisa Healy caught it behind. So um, running through and, you know, in tradition, I'm not sure if everyone knows, um, in the women's game particularly, everyone gets around you and messes up your hair and, um, yeah, just gives you pats and high fives and everything like that. So it's it's a really cool moment. It sort of, like, acknowledges a wicket more than just, you know, you've done it. But, you know, it's really cool that everyone gets around you. And I think, you know, in that moment, I think we were playing up at Metricon Stadium on the Gold Coast and, um, yeah, everyone just got around me and it was, you know, in a test match, you took your first wicket. And, um, pretty cool experience. I bet. I bet that's something you always draw back on. And like something like that, being able to perform at that level, it reminds you, like you said, that, yeah, I'm made for this. Mm, I'm made for this stage. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. I want to dive into um, the part of the podcast now, which has become a consistent theme over the course of the last couple of weeks, where we ask the same five questions to every guest who comes on the show. Always five unique answers. And it's almost like the perfect conclusion to any great conversation it's always a great trailer for some people who may be hearing this before they've heard the full episode because we release this separately too Mm -hmm. so dive into those five with you relatively rapid fire but we always extend them out (laughs) a little bit um the first question is if you could recommend one book or one podcast to someone listening what would it be okay um I recently read a book uh, by Chira Pitt. So she was the um, ultra marathon runner um, in the Kimberley who I think faced burns of 65% of her body. Um, So I recently read one of her books, um, one of her newer ones that she wrote uh, during the pandemic. Um, It's called Happy. And um, I stumbled across it. uh, Someone mentioned it in a podcast I think I was listening to. And um, I bought the book and read it and absolutely loved it. Mm. And I think, you know, at a time when it was really hard to find happiness, um, you know, everything sort of felt like a challenge. It was really cool that, you know, you could flip that and find little joys in life. And, um, yeah, I really loved how the book was written and um, something, you know, that I think isn't spoken about enough. And I think it's really cool that she sort of tried to bring that happiness back. And it's, it's a really cool book. Did she speak about her experience with the Burns or had she done that in previous books? Yeah, she'd done that in previous books. I'm actually not sure how many she's written, but I think she's got a few books out. I think that, I, that was her most recent one. So she didn't sort of speak about her burn experience. But yeah. again, that's probably another one. Because um, isn't she just an incredible human being? Absolutely. Yeah. In she's awesome. She's done so much, you know, obviously the Burns sort of when she started um you know to become a known person but since Mm. then she's done so many amazing things and it's yeah really inspirational for probably most people out there bloody oath that might be next on my list because i've been looking for a new Mm. audio book so i might have to get around that Mm. second question is what's one skill that you'd recommend mastering that significantly improved your life um uh i would say probably organization um and time management as an athlete we have a lot of things going on in our lives whether it's you know trainings or external commitments um there's always a lot going on so I I carry my planner with me everywhere um and I write down everything because as I said I'm can be forgetful at times so it's um that's probably been one thing that saved me a lot um just having that and knowing you know what I've got coming up and knowing that I can plan out my months and be on top of everything Definitely, I love that. Oh, that's something I need to work on. Yeah. I'm like notoriously two to ten minutes late to everything and I'm really working hard on it at the moment and it's it's just maybe me just being – it's not lazy because I'm always up and ready mm-hmm. and conscious but I think I just get caught up doing things because I don't plan enough. Like mm. I'm always trying to oh, – I need to do that too so I'll kind of do that in the middle of doing something else and it's definitely something I need to be better at, organisation. 
The third one is, and probably I know a sense of what your answer will be here, one challenge in your life that's required the most growth to overcome. Yeah, okay. So that that's probably at the moment with this surgery. I think um, I've been incredibly lucky up until now to sort of not – have any time out of the game essentially um, longer than sort of a couple weeks so being out of training for 12 weeks has been a challenge and something that I've had to wrap my head around Um, and yeah like we spoke about finding you know a new purpose and being able to navigate the path of you know I can't work on myself as a cricketer right now so how can I work on who I am away from cricket has probably been something that's you know I've I feel like I've already grown so much in the past six weeks. Um, mm. Just being able to acknowledge where I am and, and where I want to be um, has really been a cool challenge. And yeah, something that I knew, I sort of knew going into, I would sort of be challenged, but um, it's really cool to be on the path right now and, and discovering sort of where I want to go and where I want to get to. Amazing. So good to hear. All righty. So the fourth question is what's a daily habit or a ritual that forms a part of your life and sets you up for success? Yeah, so for me, that's probably eating breakfast. Mm. I feel like that's something that I do every day and it really sets me up to be energized and be able to get through the day. So that's something that our nutritionist as well is really passionate about is getting in a good breakfast. Um, I used to be really... Um, iffy about breakfast especially on match days I sort of you know get the feeling of a bit sick in my stomach or something like that but nowadays I love breakfast and um, yeah it really sets me up for the day. So obviously the cricketers go to breakfast is wheat bix is that your go-to year round or what does that look like? Uh, Yes I'm pretty seasonal with my breakfast so um, at the moment it's a bit cold so I'm leaning towards a bowl of oats in the morning I feel like that that's something that warms me as well as fuels me so um, I do do wheat bix maybe in the summer but uh, yeah at the moment it's oats. I love it. Last question and as I always say probably the most I think the most important part of the podcast it's a beautiful way to leave off a great conversation and to leave the audience with a message and that is if you could share one message with the world and encourage them to act on it, what would that be? Um, I'd probably say something that I've sort of grown up with is um, treating people how you wish to be treated. Mm. I think it's something super basic, but something that we probably don't you know, recognize as much. And I think it's something that has been drilled into me as a kid is, you know, being respectful and just being, you know, grateful and humble is something that I've grown up with so um yeah that's probably something that I would say you know and I'd try and get more people to do especially you know in in tough times you know like a pandemic or you know there's a lot of stuff going on in the world right now that you know is you know not always happy and not always enjoyable and tough experiences that people are dealing with uh i think you know if we can always sort of be kind to each other and just try and you know uplift one another and treat each other with respect i feel like that's something that's really small but it goes a long way to helping other people yeah that empathy and kindness is so important right hey this has been an amazing conversation i really appreciate you coming on i appreciate you opening up and sharing i'm so glad we connected because we've had some great conversations not even just here Um, but over your Instagram and I'm going to make sure that all of Stella's info like her social links and basically everywhere they can connect with you are in the show description so make sure you head across and have a look at that and I guess I'll be able to keep updated on your progress to getting back on the field yeah definitely and thanks Brad for having me I'm I'm so fortunate to have connected with you and so lucky to have found you and and all your stuff it's been you know really cool for me and um, yeah super grateful that we were able to have this chat The pleasure's all mine. Thank you so much. Make sure you guys follow, subscribe. You know, it's not a secret. Share it around. Tell the world. Um, We love that we get to connect with new people and have positive impact on listeners and viewers. So please share it around. Give it some love. And we'll see you next time. See ya.